So we see this correlation between what the veteran does in, in the sense of voluntarily saying, I want to serve my country, I want to come and lay down my own life if need be for the sake of my family, my friends, my relatives, my neighbors, people I don't even know, people I may not even like. I will lay down my life uh, for the sake of others so others may live is the whole idea. And so I, I find that this is a, a great opportunity for us to look and say, well, if that's what God calls us to do, if that's what Jesus wants me to do as a disciple, and I can see in the life of veterans who have done that in the past, then there's some things for us to learn about those things. And, and so that's why I wanted to um, put it in that context because uh, this week is, is going to be uh, a remembrance of those veterans who have, have served and all who are serving now. And so um, greater love, he says, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Jesus says, I have set the example. Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith, the Bible says. He is the captain of our salvation. And he says, in the same way that I have sacrificially laid my life down for you, I want you to, in turn, go and do that for others. And so he says, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. And so uh, we're going to talk about the military a little bit here today. It's a, a favorite subject of mine anyway. But, you know, we as a nation have really gone through it in the last couple of years, haven't we? And there is a, a lot of negativity towards the, the American experience, you know, and, and people, and I, I know uh, myself, I've, I've been very negative about the outlook of where our nation is going and uh, what's going to happen with it and all those kind of things. Um, you know, we're discouraged in a lot of ways about the direction our nation is headed and uh, where it used to be and now where we are and all those kind of things really get into our minds and, and really bum us out sometimes and discourage us. But you know, when we think about our military and we think about what they have done in the past, what they are currently doing and what they probably will, will do on into the future, you know, it, it really does encourage us to keep going as Pastor Brian was sharing this morning, uh, the courage that they have displayed in the past, the things they have done. But we find that there's this, this close knit camaraderie and even, I don't think military folks would wanna say it, but it is love. It is a sacrificial love that they show towards one another. Uh, they, they never describe it in that way because that's not manly enough. You know, that would uh, betray my manliness maybe if I described uh, what I feel for my other compatriots as love. But you see it with these two generals here, Grant and Sherman. The soldier's first article of faith is summed up nowhere more eloquently than in an 1865 letter from General Sherman to General Grant, Civil War time period we're talking, of course, here. He says, I, and this is after the war, they're corresponding with each other. He says, I knew wherever I was that you thought of me, and if I got into a tight place, you would come, if alive. You would come. No matter what situation I was in, I knew that you would, would come and, and try to rescue me. And, uh, and so this is embodied really within the military, um, you know, this idea, this unwritten, unspoken, but unbreakable contract of the battlefield. And that is the idea of leave no one behind. Leave no one behind. We will sacrifice ourselves to go and save those that are in harm's way. Why? Well, primarily we know because it's love. It's that sacrificial love. It's the love of saying, I'll do something, not just say something. I'll sacrifice. I'll go and, and uh, give my own life in an effort to try to save someone else. And it really is an amazing concept if you think about it. And I think uh, a great example of that, if you've ever heard this uh, man's name, Master Sergeant Roy Benavides. He was a Medal of Honor winner in the Vietnam War. He almost didn't get the, the medal because they thought he was going to die. They just thought, well, let's give him the Silver Star, and maybe later, if he dies, we'll, 
will posthumously award him the, the Medal of Honor. But he ended up living. Uh, Special Forces Airborne Ranger, he uh, received that medal for his actions in a firefight that has been called Six Hours in Hell. And this is a little bit lengthy, but I want to give you a feel for what we're talking about here today, this sacrificial love for uh, others. Six Hours of Hell. In April of 1968, a Special Forces reconnaissance team was inserted by helicopter into a dense jungle in Vietnam. Meeting heavy enemy resistance, they requested emergency extraction. But when three rescue helicopters attempted, they were unable to land due to intense enemy fire. Master Sergeant Benavides voluntarily boarded one of the returning choppers and directed the pilots to hover briefly near the battle, allowing him to leap from the chopper into the jungle. This guy is incredible. I mean, they couldn't land. The firefight is so bad, they couldn't land. And he says, well, go over there in that clearing and just hover for a second. I'll jump out and you fly off. And that's what he did. Now, I've heard that he jumped out without a gun. All he had was a medevac kit because he was going to save these guys that were dying. And so he figured he wasn't gonna be having time to shoot. So he jumped out with just the medevac kit in his hand. Incredible. The story goes that it, running approximately 100 yards under enemy fire to the crippled team, he sustained wounds to his right leg, face, and head. He took charge of the scene, eventually dragging half of the wounded to a medevac helicopter presumably back over that 100-yard area, and then ran alongside the helicopter as it moved to pick up more wounded, and then he's kind of throwing them into the helicopter as he's picking them up. As Benavides went back to secure classified documents from the body of a dead soldier, the helicopter's pilot was mortally wounded and the aircraft crashed. But he secured the documents, went back to the helicopter, aided the wounded out of the downed aircraft, and then guided the men to a defensive position where he then called in airstrikes to neutralize the enemy threat. When another helicopter came, he ferried the wounded, killed one NVA soldier in hand-to-hand -hand combat, and killed two others that were charging the helicopter from behind. After ensuring that all the wounded were on board, he collapsed outside of the helo, but his body was seen and pulled aboard. Thinking he was dead, a doctor put him in a body bag and only stopped zipping it when, his, when Benavides spat in his face, <laughs> which earned him the title of the Lazarus soldier. They believed he was dead. They zipped him up in the body bag, and then he spits at the doctor, and, and uh, he's alive. Benavides sustained seven major gunshot wounds, had shrapnel in his head, scalp, shoulder, buttocks, feet and legs, and both arms slashed by a bayonet and had a collapsed lung. He lived and went on to epitomize what is meant to be in special forces. Quite a, quite a story, quite a story. But um, I think he passed away back in the 90s, late 90s, but uh, just really, you know, people started saying, hey, that's what it means to be a, an airborne ranger. You know, that's what it means to be a Navy SEAL. That's what it means to be a, a special forces commando, is that kind of sacrifice, that kind of bravery. And, uh, and so, of course, he earns this Medal of Honor trophy. Well, uh, many have served in, in such ways over the years. And, uh, you know, our military, they really have gone through it in the last 100, 150 years or so, uh, really, really gone through the, the, the mill. But, you know, how do we justify referring to ourselves in those kind of terms? Well, we get that from the Bible itself. You know, the Bible goes into great detail about the idea that we are in a spiritual war, that there is a war going on all around us. And the Apostle Paul himself says, look, Timothy, you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. You've been called to serve in his special forces, and it's not going to be easy. It's going to be a difficult road both in a spiritual sense and uh, just a natural sense as we are persecuted for our faith in Jesus Christ. But he says, hey, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life. 
that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And so there is that idea that a soldier needs to be single-minded and focused upon the task at hand and not be too caught up in the affairs of this life because, of course, uh, you may de be deployed at any time. I remember we had uh, uh, some friends out in California when we were out there in my first tour in the Navy. Uh, you know, I was deploying and going on long deployments, but uh, these guys were Navy SEALs and... Uh, Geraldine actually was friends with the wife of one of these guys. And she said, you know, he would come home someday and just say, well, I'm leaving. And uh, pack up his bags and he'd be gone, you know, for a year, year and a half, nine months, however long. She doesn't know where he's going. She doesn't know how long he's gonna be gone. He's just gone and he ain't coming back. So I just gotta get that in my head kind of idea. But uh, the hardships of that, the sacrifice of that, what you know our forces have to endure i remember a point in my own career as i was getting towards the end of my navy career uh the deployments were just getting to me and i just thought man i just don't want to do this anymore just don't want to go anymore I, it's not worth it to me to sacrifice my family in this way any longer and, and that's when i ended up retiring but uh, the sacrifices are many and again we can parallel that with the life of a believer that we are called to sacrifice, not only in the sense of giving towards others, but we're just called to be separate from this world. And, uh, you know, my wife and I were talking about the other day, you know, the direction our world is going and, and what Hollywood is doing and the media, what they're doing, and the nonsense and the garbage that they are trying to get everybody just to follow along into. We just had this sense that, boy, I guess we're just going to have to become more separate than we ever have been. You know, does that mean we have to stop watching TV? Does that mean we have to stop going to the movies? There are two movies that came out uh, that uh, our whole family wanted to go see, but we're so gun shy now about the garbage that's in the movies. We looked it up first, you know, well, what's in this? What garbage is in this one? No, we're not going to that movie. What's in this one? No, we're not going to that movie. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's calling us as believers to be more separate than we've ever been. And being separate in a society means you've got to sacrifice. You've got to sacrifice things that your flesh and your body and your mind would normally want to enjoy. You have to say, no, I'm, I'm not going to do that. I've been called into warfare and uh, I want to please the one who has enlisted me into this battle. And it's worth it for the sake of all of eternity that I serve him and serve him only in that way that is separated from the world that I'm in. 